Well, I've been looking forward to coming here and uh, for a lot of different reasons, but um, I don't know if any of you knew my mom and dad. I know, uh, I don't know what they call you on here, but it's uh, a Glenn and Patty to me. And, uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, my mom and dad pastored in Mount Vernon, Indiana for seven years, and I was just a young little boy, and we would come up here to Evansville, and uh, we would come for zone rallies and revivals, and uh, while wow, a lot of a lot of waters under the bridge since then, but a lot of good memories, and uh, and uh, just have a lot of good childhood memories in Mount Vernon and this area. And so, we came up every day to Evansville Christian School when I was a kid to come here to school. And so, my dad would drive us up, and he worked in Evansville. And so, well, I won't go through all the details, but anyway, just a lot of memories that uh, we had here, and uh, I know that God was just wants to help us this week. Amen. All right. Well, let's stand and let's open our Bibles to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. Ask, and it shall be given you. We talked about promises already. Our brother Jackman did. And ask, and it shall be given you. Seek, and ye shall find. Knock, and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. We're going to focus just a little bit on what I thought about asking tonight. For everyone that asketh, receiveth. And he that seeketh, findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be open. And what man is there of you, whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? Verse 11. If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father which is in heaven give good things to them that ask him. How many like to receive good things from the Lord? I do. Well, the promise here that God wants to give us good things. And when we think of good things, we think of a pay raise. Uh, we think of a new car. But that's not what we really desperately need. We need things from the Lord. Um, but God wants to give us good things. And um, then there's a little part of a phrase I want to take out of James chapter 4, verse 2. You can turn to that if you want to, but just a little um, phrase that I want to pull out of that verse. It says, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. You have not, because ye ask not. And let's have a word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for your presence that we have sensed tonight. And we believe, Lord, that you want to do some good things for all of us. We're all of all in this together. None of us are above each other. We just recognize our need of, of you, renewal, revival, strengthening our spiritual lives. And so we pray tonight, you've already told us in your scripture that, that we cannot do anything, we can't do anything without you. And so we need your presence, we need the Holy Spirit to come and touch my lips and my heart and and touch the hearts that are here, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So the, the title of my uh, message tonight is Doing Without. And my thought is that so many times we, we do without so much more than God really wanted us to do without. You know, there, just, just on a side note, just since the big, well, since after Christmas until this time, there has been at least six definite answers of prayer that God has answered for me clearly. I fervently sought God for these six things, and God answered prayer clearly. I just want to praise the Lord for that. 
Praise the Lord for that. Now I'm going to give you a quote from Henry Ford. This isn't real spiritual, but it has. It's going to, we're going to make it spiritual. I don't know if you're a Ford guy or a Chevy guy or what you are, and I don't really care. I have, I've had all, all of those. And I don't want to hear from Glenn because guys that work on cars are always opinionated about things. So I don't want to hear anything from Glenn. But Henry Ford says this, or said this. I don't think he's saying it today. If you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got. I like it when important people use the word got. Because then I can use it. But the idea that Henry Ford is trying to express, and we are going to make a spiritual application out of it, is that the idea is your desire to change must be greater than. You know, when I was a kid, you know what the greater than, the... You know, the little triangles you made, greater than, less than. There's a lot of things I didn't figure out, but that was easy for me to figure out because the big one always goes to the bigger number. So that was easy. I could figure that one out real quick. But Henry, the idea is your desire to change must be greater than your desire just to be the same or to remain the same. Because if your desire to change isn't greater than just, just being the same, you will always be what you've always been. The same thing applies to us as we need God. All of us need God to make consistent changes in our lives. Sorry. God never gets done working on us. And I'm glad. I like a spiritual life that God continues to work on. I don't, I, don't, I don't like things to remain the same. I get bored real quick. And so I love it because God is so much greater and smarter and wiser than us that He wants to constantly make changes in us. And a very, very exciting and a vibrant spiritual life is when we allow God to continue to make changes in our lives consistently. Isn't that beautiful? That we just don't remain the same. The scripture verse in James, as I've already said, says, Yet ye have not because you ask not. What that means is, and what God is trying to, what James is trying to tell us in the scriptures that we talked about, asking and you shall receive, means if you cannot stop in your life and pause and seek after God for help. That's a key word in this message help. If we cannot stop in our lives and seek after God for help in our lives, then we will never have or find your life to be any more for God than it's already been. That means we will never know anything more than we already do about the things of God. That's boring. We will never have any more of God in our lives than we've already got. That's boring. I don't want to live that kind of religious life. That's boring. We will never experience any more than we've already experienced of God. That's boring. Wouldn't that be a sad picture for a Christian? That he or she becomes complacent in their religious or their Christian life that they, as Jesus said in the Revelations, that they were rich and increased with goods and had need of nothing... Wouldn't that be sad whether that person was 15 or 25 or 45 or 65 or 85 that he doesn't see a need for God to continue to make changes in his life? I call that dead end. Oops, dead. I call that a Christian that comes to a place in his life, he just hits dead end. He never has any more of God than he's already got. So we would go through life here on earth doing without. Remember, that's our title. We would go through here on life, here, we would go through life here on earth doing without so much more than God ever intended for us to do without. It might be that this revival 
that at least a couple of us might need to say, Lord, help. Many times it's hard for us to admit how much help we really need. So we struggle in our walk with God or in our life. We struggle a lot more than we should be struggling with because we haven't asked God for help. I don't know if you, anybody here knows of E.V. Hill. Anybody heard of E.V. Hill? A few of us. Well, he was, uh, I used to listen to him on, yeah, on tape, when we had tapes back then, you know. And I used to listen to a lot of his preaching. I, I had people giving me some of his, his messages. But E.V. Hill was a, a fairly large black minister, a powerful minister or preacher. And... Um, he was speaking in conventions in Africa, and he was in Africa, and he, uh, during, between some of the sessions or something like that, I remember him telling the story, he, he, he said to some of his friends, he said, I, I just want to go to the real Africa. I want to go to, I, I want to go to the jungle. I mean, he was in the cities, and there were skyscrapers, and there were cars, and, and traffic, and he really wanted to go to the heart of the jungle. He said, I want to go and see what it's really like there. So he finally found a taxi that would take him there, and it was about a two-hour drive. And finally, the taxi driver said, "Okay, Evie Hill, I, I go no farther. I go no farther. I, I stop here. If you want to see the jungle, you're going to have to walk for walk by yourself." So Evie got out of the car and began to walk to the jungle. And he didn't get, he didn't get too far into the jungle as, as a native jumps out around a tree. And as Evie Hill sees the native, as he jumped out around the tree, Evie Hill, a very large man, began to run and run through the jungle. And he ran and ran, and, and he was about out of breath, and he finally he tripped over a log and fell flat on his face. And he said, that, as I was lying flat on my face, I've been running, as I was lying flat on my face, I was thinking, Evie, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die, you're going to die. And so, so I turned up to look at up at the native, and in clear English, the native said, do you need a guide? <laughs> After the native got him up, got the dirt off, dirt off of him, began to walk into the jungle, he took Evie Hill back where he had ran and said, you ran right through, there's plenty of poisonous snakes there, there's that, there's that all kind, you, know, you could have fell there, you could have caught, there was all kinds of dangers that Evie Hill ran right through. Unfortunately, there are times when we do exactly what Evie Hill did. We try to go through this life so many times, dealing with our own problems, our own struggles, our own difficulties, trying to handle them on our own. And God's saying, do you need a guide? All you have to do is ask. I'm here. I'm here to help you. I'm here to give you direction. I think we need to stop doing that. I think God needs to help our faith where we start believing that God cares for us again. And that God cares about the little things in our lives. And that we can ask Him and we can pray and we can fervently bring our needs to Him. And we can say, Lord, I need help in my life. I need help. James chapter 1 verse 5 says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. Is our desire to change greater than our desire just to be the same? If so, then we must ask God for help in our lives to make changes and to help us to be greater than we've ever been before. How many remembers uh, Winnie Pooh and Piglet books? Well, when we were kids, we didn't have all. We didn't have any. We didn't have any technology. You know how that goes. Back then, we had a record player. That's all we had. And I remember how cool I thought we were. Uh, Craig, my oldest brother, we both had paper routes in Mount Vernon, and he saved up enough money and got him and an alarm clock with digital, 
and we had that on our dresser. And I thought we were living up, we were living the, the techno world. Boy, I thought, I remember looking at that clock thinking, man, we are so cool. We've got this clock that shows the number and it's lit, it's lit, it's lit. I remember that. I thought we were so cool. I'm not near as old as a, a lot of these guys, so some of these didn't even have electricity. Glenn probably grew up, with, grew up without electricity. I don't know. But anyway, I do remember as a kid, specifically in the winter, we didn't have technology, so we went to the library every two weeks. Why did we go to the library every two weeks? Because your books were due every two weeks. And so you would go to the library, and you'd get all the, specifically in the winter, because I like to play outside, so when it was, the weather was nice, I was outside. But we would go get all these books, and we would get Winnie the Pooh, and I remember Winnie the Pooh and Piglet books, and Mom would read some of those to us. But just not too long ago, I heard Harry Plank. I don't know if you know who Harry Plank is, but did you hear him give this illustration? Anyway, Harry Plank gave a quote the other day I thought that would go right with this little topic, a little thought about asking God for help. This is what the quote was. Pooh, what's the bravest thing you have ever said? What is the bravest thing you have ever said? Asked Piglet. Pooh responds, help. What's the bravest thing you have ever said? Help. You know, sometimes, sometimes we just, we, we think, whether it's in our marriage, whether it's a job, whether it's in our church, whether whatever we're going through, sometimes we don't do the bravest thing. We don't go to God and say, God, I need help. Sometimes we don't go to a friend and say, hey, you know, I just need some help. I need help. Just maybe it's time we start asking for help. God, help me in this area. God, help, help me. Make some new changes in my life. We sing that chorus, change my heart, O God, make it ever true. Change my heart, O God, may I be like you. You are the potter, I am the clay. Mold me and make me, this is what I pray. Is this truly our desire? Do we truly have a great desire for God to make changes in us? If we do, then we must, we must ask. Ask, ask. If we do not want to do without what God wants to do for us, then we must start asking for help. Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, as we already said, Ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Jesus is asking us to persistently turn to God for help. To seek him diligently for help in our lives. You have not because you ask not. There's plenty of scriptures regarding in the God's word about asking. Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that worketh in us. That's a good promise. Brother Jackman talked about we have the promises of God. Somebody should say, well, thank God. Praise the Lord that when we ask, He does abundantly above what we ask. Though that's not just out of some poetry book. That's out of God's Word that the promises that if we persistently ask, He'll do abundantly whatever we ask. 1 John chapter 3, verse 22 and whatsoever we ask, we receive of him, because we keep his commandments and do those things that's pleasing in his sight. 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 1 John chapter 5, verse 15. If we know that he hears us, he does. Whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of him. 
Not to be repetitious tonight, but if we really, really want God to make changes in us, and we don't want just to always be the same, and we desire to be changed more than we desire just to remain the same, then we must begin to ask God to make changes in us. Isn't that what revival is all about? I think we always need to, we need to remind ourselves about revival. Why are we going to have these services throughout this week? So at the end of the week, we felt God's presence, which is wonderful. We feel better, which is wonderful. But that'll last a couple days. Until Tuesday or Wednesday or something might happen in your life, and all of a sudden, those feelings or the good time goes away. We need more than just good feelings. But we want, what we want in this revival is God to do drastic things in our lives and make some drastic spiritual changes in our lives. That we will walk out of this revival with an amazing spiritual growth in our lives. And God do some great things in us. <coughs> we say, well, Brother Lyon, don't you know I'm saved and sanctified? Don't get me started. Can we stop thinking like that? Of course, it's vitally important that we have both works of grace in our lives. Not taken away from that. That's great that you're saved and you're entirely sanctified. But to be honest, in a Christian's life, that is just the foundation that God has to begin to really work on a person's life. He has a whole lot of changes to do in our life since now our will is fully surrendered to Him. Before we get entirely sanctified, God's having a struggle. He's having an awful time. He's having a real difficult molding and shaping us to be what He wants us to be. But after we get entirely sanctified, we get filled with the Spirit, and we're fully surrendered, God has a lot of work. He's like got a whole playground. He's got your whole life, and He's molding and shaping your life for years and years and years because He has you now in His hands. Getting entirely sanctified is not instant perfection. I wish it was, but I've never met anybody that's ever gotten like that. Right. And I've been around a lot of entirely sanctified people, but I'm telling you, there's some of them saying, you know what? God's still working on them, and right. God's still working on you, and God's still working on me, and God wants to continue to make changes and work and work in our lives until we enter into glory. There's no dead ends in walking with God. I'm glad. I hate dead ends. Allsworth Chambers says, it's an indictment, it's an indictment to God to say that God can't make me a glorious saint. Listen, God wants to make us a glorious saint. God wants to make us saints of God, filled with the Spirit on power, in full of His power, praying and carrying a burden and being all that God wants us to be. That's what God wants us to be. And He's molding and shaping our lives to help us to be what He wants us to be. Well, you say, Brother Lyon, you talked about asking. Well, so what should we ask? Well, I'm glad you asked. When I was working on this message and God gave it to me, He uh, simply directed me to the Lord's Prayer that He gave us. A very basic prayer that is very important. And so we're going to look at some things that God asks us to do. And I just realized I don't have a clock on the wall, but I have right on here, so I just look. But it, mine says 9.03, it's really late. That's from Cocoa time. I know it's not that late, thank the Lord. Jesus taught us to pray, Thy kingdom come. Thy kingdom come. And the last time I checked, we're here. We're here on a very dark planet. We're here on a, in a very dark world. And everywhere we look, there's evil, despondency, difficulties, troubles, and trials. And we're in a mess here. And so if there's anything that we need in our day, 
is we need assistance from another world. And we need God to come and to work in our lives, in our hearts, in our church, the holiest movement. We really need the kingdom of God. We need His glory. We can't fix these things ourselves and we can't figure things out on our own. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we're in need of God coming in these days. Stepping in and making the difference. What do we need? We don't need more plans and programs. We need the presence and the glory of God coming and working in our hearts and our lives. It's time that we realize more than ever that we need God. I see a religious world. I see the holiness movement in dire need of the glory and the presence and the power of God in this day. We need change quickly. We need to change from religious people to godly people. We need the kingdom of God to come. We need the graces of God to come to us. We need His love and His peace and His purity and His truth and His wisdom and His kindness. And God's people need to, to have joy again. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And God's people need to be joyous again. And so what we need, we need the presence and the glory of God to come. We need the kingdom of God to come to our lives. I read a quote the other day. To live by the ways of heaven, here is to find peace on earth. And we can walk with God in a very troubled day and have the peace of God in our lives and the presence of God and His kingdom resting upon our lives. We need the kingdom of God to come to each and every one of us individually. We need the kingdom of God to come to this church. As a family of God, we need to be united in the kingdom of God to come in our lives. We will only experience true change when God comes on the scene. And this song doesn't really apply specifically for in this message, but I, I wanted it to, to, I wanted to give it because it talks. About, it's a song that talks about change. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful day! Day I shall never forget. After I wandered in darkness away, Jesus, my Savior, I met. Oh, what a tender, compassionate friend! He met the need of my heart, shadows dispelling, with joy I am telling, I'm telling you, he made all the darkness depart. Heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. When at the cross the Savior made me whole, my sins were washed away, and my night was turned to day, heaven came down, and glory filled my soul. What happened in this song? Somebody reached out and touched another kingdom to come. And God's glory and God's presence came from way up there, down here, and filled this individual's life, and there was a drastic change in his life. And heaven came down and glory filled his soul. There was change made when God came. We have not because we ask not. And we don't want to remain the same. We desire change more than just being the same. And so we pray and we ask our Father, Father, which art in heaven, we need your kingdom to come in this day. Do we believe that tonight? We need God's kingdom to come. Another prayer that Jesus taught us to pray was, Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Are we willing to pray that prayer? Knowing that God's will is often so much different than ours. In fact, generally it's always different. You know, and I just told somebody this the other day, and they're trying to find God's will, and I, and I, I told them, I said, you know, I said, I'll just have to be honest. Probably what I thought how God was going to work or what He was going to do I've probably been 95% wrong. Because God always has a different plan. His plan is always the best. But 
But God, God always has a different plan. And so we have to pray, Lord, thy will be done in us as it is in heaven. Are we willing to allow God's differences with us to change us? Yes or no? Repeat that. Are we willing to allow God's differences with us to change us? Are we willing to let God change us? Are we willing to become clay in the potter's hand? Surely we reckon our, recognize our individuality. And what I mean is that Justin is made up as Justin. I'm made up as I am. And my wife is made up and Glenn's made up for sure like he is. And we're all made up different. And so God's, God's got these things He wants to work on Justin on. To work His will in His life. God's got these things He wants to work on Glenn's life. God's got these things He wants to work on my life. He's got different things in all of us. But He's got things He wants to do. He wants to perform His will in our lives. And so we've got to be willing to be clay in His hands. This is one of my pet peeves. And maybe you've said it before. And maybe I've thought it before. But when we say that's just who I am, what I'm really saying is I am more satisfied to remain the same than to allow God to change me into what He wants me to be. Ah, I'm just always rude in the mornings. Well, maybe God doesn't want you to be rude in the mornings. Okay? I, I'm just, this is my makeup. I just, this is just how I act sometimes. Well, you know what? Maybe that is who you are, but I, I'd say God maybe would want to refine me. Work right. He has me. My wife would I'm a, my wife would just say, I'm just such a Prince Charming compared to when we first got here. I won't make her for saying up the same. I'm teasing. But I I I, could, I I believe she would say that after 30 years that God has molded and shaped me and I'm a better husband than I was 30 years ago. Because God has continued to mold and shape me to learn how to love my wife. And, treat her properly. I don't think there's anything greater than to ask God, Lord, here I am. Help me. I want to be what you want me to be. And sometimes that means sacrifices and sometimes that means giving up some things and sometimes that might mean going to apologize. Sometimes that who, who, who knows what that might mean? But it's more than likely, it's more likely that, that God is waiting and wanting to make some changes in our lives in order for His will to be done in us. This is what I want to do with you. This is what I want to accomplish with you. But you've got to let me change some things that you can be what I want you to be. Remember our Lord's Prayer, Matthew chapter 26, 39. Oh, my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as thou wilt. We have not because we ask not. So today we ask in this revival, not only, Lord, do we want your kingdom to come, but we ask the Lord, Lord, your will be done in my life. Whatever changes, whatever you want to do in my life, that's what I want. I want to be exactly what you want me to be. Number three, give us this day our daily bread. Give us this day our daily bread. Jesus recognizes in his prayer that we will have earthly needs and we are taught and we are to learn dependence upon God for them. Now, I know none of us are worried about if we have clothes to wear tomorrow. And I'm pretty sure we all look like we're good and fed. None of us are worried about food. We've got food. 
But you know what? There's a whole lot more than there's a whole lot more we as God's people need than just clothes and food. We're always so much better off when we've learned to stay regularly dependent upon God for our daily needs. See, Jesus taught this prayer is praying for something daily. And so often we find ourselves trying to fix something, trying to solve an issue, trying to pay for something, trying to work for something, trying to figure it out, worrying about something, stressed out about something, only to do without so much because we don't turn to God for that daily need. The child of God has many, many daily needs, like strength, protection, mental help, emotional strength, physical healing, spiritual renewal. Those are some things that we desperately need. And so often we don't get those needs met because we don't say, Lord, I need help. I need help. I'm going to give us one more and then I'm going to stop. And don't say amen, please. Forgive us our debts as we forget our debtors. Surely we don't think we are above asking God for forgiveness in our lives. I'm not talking about rebellious sin or willful sin. But I'm talking about sometimes who you are and who I am. And there's sometimes we need to say, Lord, I need, I need you to forgive me. I have not been. I have not been faithful like I should be. I have not prayed like I should. I have not been faithful in this area like I should. And there's times that we need to ask God to forgive us. Just forgive us. There's nothing better than to keep, keep every channel clear. There's a message I preach, talked about unclogging the channels. And sometimes there's some things that clog our channels. And if we, and if we think that we never need to ask God to forgive us for some things. Then we, we become like the Pharisees who were good at keeping the outside of the cup clean, but inside they weren't. And so we need to ask God forgiveness in our lives in order to keep our inside clean. Maybe it's an attitude, critical spirit, quick to judge, maybe a lack of long-suffering, maybe short on kindness, maybe a lack of mercy. But so many times we have not that clearness between us and God because we don't say, Lord, we don't ask God to forgive us for some things that we just need to get cleared up. Ye have not because ye ask not. So we pray, Father, in this revival, we want you to forgive us for anything. Anything. We want, we want our channels clear. We want our channels clear. You need to thank me because I'm skip, skipping three points. But I want to give this in closing. Referring back to some of our opening statements again. In order to have change in our life, we must desire change more than staying the same. So therefore, in this revival, we're going to stop and ask God to make the necessary changes he needs to make because we're not going to just be the same. Because if we don't, if we don't do that in a setting like this, this week, we will continue to go through life doing without so much more than God ever intended us to do without. Doing without so much more than God ever intended to, us to ever do without. So we have not because we ask not. 
So I think it's this week, it's time for us to say, Lord, help. We need you. 